Okay. Okay. All, All right. right. Uh, okay, we're gonna go ahead and get start. Start. Well, I'm just gonna go ahead real quick and let you know. Um, while we were taking a little break, Andrea had mentioned that she asked one of the developers about the SRS Advanced Merge option, and he did say that you do have to do it one at a time right now. So if you have more than one, you would have to go out and do one, create the file, verify it, and then you'd have to go out and and you know do the same thing with the next um, third party vendor file that you have. So we do have an answer to that question, and Pat. It's all yours, go right ahead. Okay, so I'll be covering the release updates for USAS. Um, it goes from April through June, actually July 3rd, which contained the 8.24 release. So we're gonna be covering just highlights of the 8.18 through 8.24. Um, sorry. So you can find that on the wiki. Under state software redesign and then going to the USAS redesign. If you wanna look at the release notes. Also on the wiki where you signed up, I do have a PowerPoint out there for today. It's very, oops, I'm sorry. It's very generic and I'm gonna be covering more than what it contains on this PowerPoint. But if you want, if you were interested, you could get that here under July 16th. All right, so I'm going to start with the release from April, which gave the ability to import purchase orders using a CSV file. This was JIRA issue USAS R4421, which was included in the release 8.19. First, I'm gonna show you uh, the documentation, which will take you to the import criteria as well as getting this template spreadsheet with all the required um, headers. Down below, you can find the criteria that is either required for the field or required for the CSV file. I do have a um, example, so I'm gonna pull that up just to show you and we'll take a look at what we are going to import. <clears throat> so here's my file. I leave the purchase order field blank. It will auto populate. Every new purchase order starts with an item one. So the first two lines are one purchase order. And then it starts another purchase order and so forth. So, so forth. This one happens to be a split PO, so we're gonna import that as well. The first two lines of the item number is gonna split to the two accounts. And then the second line of the purchase order, third line, fourth line. However, on a CSV file import for purchase orders, this reference number column is required. And it's usually matches the item number. However, when it comes to a purchase order that has a split item, this is the purchase order line one, but this reference number is the split purchase order account number one. And then the second account number that you're split into is line two. So then the yeah, third- I'm, I'm sorry. Can you double check and make sure you're recording? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have the option of pausing or stopping. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure. I just saw a red circle. I just wanted to verify. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, no problem. 
So this would be the purchase order line, and this would be the account line, and I'll show that to you on an actual purchase order once we convert it. Um, and I think that's what I wanted it to say. So we will go to the instance and import that under purchase orders. And we'll convert the multi-line purchase order, a single line purchase order, and that split line purchase order. So we click on import, choose my file. Load it and it should give you five records loaded, no errors. If you had errors, it would let you know what it means. So once you close that, the four purchase orders are there. This one is the split PO. So this is what I was talking about. This is PO line one, two, three, four, but the count not, or the reference number is one, two, three, four, five. So hopefully by seeing that, that makes sense. Another update that we had regarding purchase orders were the ability to choose a cancel date on purchase, purchase order items that have not been invoiced or paid. So I'm gonna pull up a purchase order to view it, select amend, and you see that Line two has no ability to amend or cancel amend. And that's because it has a payable out there. However, line one has not been paid. So I can cancel that by doing that. And this is what is the update. You can select your cancellation date. The only, um, Oh, and I wanted to show you that it also gives you that tool tip. So you can choose your date. The only requirements is that it has to be after the purchase order date and it has to be in an open posting period. So again, I'm gonna do that, choose today. And then it reflects that it has been canceled. And the encumbrance amount on that line is now removed as of that cancellation date that I entered, which happened to be today. We also had an update regarding requisitions and the ability to add attachments to requisitions. So for example, the high school secretary wants to submit um, this quote to the Dell computer purchase order. So if I go to the purchase order and edit it, down below the items, you have this area of attachments where I can add a file. I can either drag the file and drop it or select the file. Um, And you see it adds here, you can download it. You can add multiple attachments. However, if you do the same file, it'll give you that warning because I already have that same quote for the same name of the file. However, like I said, you can select other ones. So say I have a purpose and budget statement that I wanna attach to. So you can have multiple ones and you can also delete. Please let Does me know. Guys... RAM? Does that go over to RAM? Or do they have to add it in RAM as well? I don't know. Okay. This is this is Carrie from LACA. It does not flow into RAM. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, 
Also in April on the 8.18, you can now use XREF codes with posting receipts rather than using the whole, whole account code like on a CVS file. This was in, this was a JIRA issue USAS R4401. And an example of this would be um, getting a spreadsheet from another system like for student fees or cafeteria monies. And I am going to pull up the documentation because you can get the import receipt template as well as the required fields and the formats. And as for an example, we'll be importing this form. Again, if I leave the receipt number blank, it'll auto populate. I can include my reduction of expenditures along with my receipts in the same spreadsheet. On the same note, I can have receipts with XREFs or without. Um, XREFs are case sensitive. So whatever's on your spreadsheet must match what's on the account. And I'll show you that in a moment. And because it's a CSV file, um, not sure why, but if there's a comma in a field, it will take that and encase it in quotations. And I'll show you that when it gets um, imported in as well. Okay, so, oh, the XREFs trump over the account code. So I'm going to go back to the instance and Go to my receipt grid. No, sorry, I'm going to the accounts, to the revenue accounts to show you the XREFs. So XREFs are entered under the revenue accounts. And you can see I have some for class fees, but I also have some for oops, cafeteria funds. And pull that to the top. So if this XREF has to match what's on the account, but what I was saying about the XREFs trumping what's on the spreadsheet, notice that the a la carte XREF is actually the function of 1513. So you can, this will still work, but what the system's going to do is going to put it to the account of 1513 because it's going to go by the XREF first, if that makes sense. So now I'm going to go to the receipt grid to import this. Again, you choose your file. Once you load it, it will give you eight records loaded. And notice, even though that account code was different, it didn't give you an error. It just did what I said it would do. It just trumps over the account code. So when you go, here's the receipts that entered and I think it was this one. The a la carte actually went to the right account. Uh, let's see. We also had updates on several, several reports. One of them being in May on a, uh, release 8.20. And this was actually a report in the periodic menu, the appropriation recap report. So now when this report is generated, um, you can summarize recap by fund or 
if you uncheck it, it will be summarized by fund special cost center. But once that's created or generated, I'll show you an example. Oh, sorry, I went to my other screen. So I'm gonna scroll. At the very end of the report, it'll recap how you specified you wanted the recap report with the total. So that was the, the update. We also had an update on the vendor new hire report. So you are now able to enter this date and when it's the reported date. So when you do that, it'll show on the report as right here, reported date. So then that was something requested. Oh, sorry, that was just the header. So if I put in 716, this would show reported date of 716. <coughs> in June, on the 8.22, we created XDOC reports um, for the use of SOC 1 audits. These are now included in the report bundle under the auditor report bundle. And if you view the um, report bundle, you can see that the reports included in here are the ones that the auditors usually look at. So it's the SSDT user listing AOS extract, the authentication and password requirement configuration report, as well as the default break-in detection and invasion rule report. Currently, this isn't tied to, um, what is the word I'm looking for? It's not tied to a trigger to um, kick off this report bundle. So currently you have to manually schedule it. And that's why you see the report bundle scheduler on this SSDT bundle. Notice the other SSDT bundles do not have that capability. And in the first quarter of 2022, the audit report bundle will also become unedible or unschedulable. There'll be a something set up to run on a particular day. And then that's when the report bundle will no longer be schedulable. So, um, and this will go to the fiscal archive. I think I, yeah, it'll go to the fiscal year reports archive when it's generated. But to go, I'll show you how to manually set it up. You'll click on that schedule icon and see the normal report bundle pop up. To run it immediately, you notice that these populated it itself and then you can save and it'll shoot over to the fiscal year report archive. If you do need another year, you would simply just change the year here. Another report is that we made the financial detail report to be a canned report. Now you still can find the template report in, you know, under the template reports, but this will run much faster. We added a save and recall so that users can save their report runs to be selected to run later at a different time. So once I do that, I also have the report direct link that I can create. 
um, you're required to have a date. And if you don't, you notice it will give you a red warning, basically, that you need a date that's required. We added several options of the format, including Excel dat data. We, you have all those parameters. And then down here on the total as of, you have a drop down for the period, as well as the count filter. And this is the count filter drop down. I have a scrambled database, so my account filters are named funny but those are account filters. And then you have an option to support or run a summary report. You also have the ability over here to control your control breaks or page breaks before you generate the report. And then we also had a correction that prevents the like zero amounts on the report from displaying as a blank and then it will now properly display as a 0, 0.00. These report formats were also added to other reports such as the appropriation reports and the certificate reports. So now those can be also generated with several more options, including the Excel data, which was often requested. Uh, per performance improvements were made. Um, one of them included uh, like a posting period indicator. So if I close June, you get this indicator and it won't let me add or create a posting period um, while the work is being done in the background. We still advise you to ensure your file archive reports are populated before closing another posting period. Just, uh, just some caution, but this won't let me do anything until some of the account history calculations are done in the background. We, re, with that rewrite of the financial canned report, the financial detail canned report, now it runs 99.98% faster as of June's release 8.22. And loading report definitions under the report generator or the report manager, when you load the report definition, it is now 94 to 99% faster. Um, with the version 8.23. Account change had several performance improvements, um, average of 94.5% improvement. And that was with the 8.23 release as well as um, 8.21 release, which corrected the handling of like budgeting transactions with the account change. And then there were um, fund changes. In June, we updated um, what used to be considered an agency fund. And basically it's just renaming the agency to custodial. So now instead of the district agency fund, it's the district custodial fund. It's now the employee benefits custodial fund and the student managed activity fund. However, once, um, oops, once that was recategorized, I guess, they realized that student management activity funds really don't fit the description of what um, a custodial fund is. Uh, so in September, they're reclassifying it to be special revenue. 
And if you want to follow the JIRA issue, it'll be that JIRA issue included in a release in September um, to update that. Um, just a note on this, if, you, if the district had like the word agency in the account description, that was not updated. So they might want to update their records if their descriptions had that word in it. Oops. And the reason um, they're changing it is changing it in September is basically has to do with the involvement of administration in the student managed funds and the definition of a custodial fund. It didn't match, so now they're moving it out to special revenue. And they're waiting until period H is closed so that fiscal year 21 can be reported accurately. And then the change will take place in fiscal year 22. We also had some tickets, I don't have this on the screenshot, but we had some tickets regarding a, um, let's see if I have it. It was a CCIP note from ODE that um, ODE put out regarding fund uh, 584 about the name change. Well. It's not gonna come up for me, but so uh, we had a ticket regarding this and we did get confirmation July 14th from the Auditor of State that yes, that description will change. So 584 used to be called the Drug-Free School Grant Fund and now it will be called the uh, Title IV Part A Student Supports and Academic Enrichment Fund. That will be included on an upcoming release. Um, currently it's scheduled for version 8.26, but if that's not the release, it's JIRA issue USAS R4660. So once that's released, some of the reports like, I think it's the appropriation resolution that still shows the old description. Once that release is released, it'll reflect a new description for that account. Uh, we had some improvements to the accounts receivable customer statement, which includes an April release 8.19 that added the vendor's name to the statement. So if the vendor had a customer name to like DBA Rock and Roll LLC, that will now show on your statement. So 104. So you see now it's showing. We also, as I just showed you, you can specify which customer or which ledger codes that you include in your report. So we added that ability too. And <coughs> another update, this uh, date in the upper right-hand corner of the statement is now reflecting the date that you run it. Sorry. <clears throat> also, previously, it didn't include credits. So it wasn't a complete picture. So I am going to show you one with credits. So now it makes sense. He, charges were 1,000 minus a credit. The actual balance actually is reflected. Also in accounts receivable, you now can add a custom bill. 
So a custom form. So instead of looking like the default, which looks fine, here's the default form. We are gonna, I'm gonna take one with a logo and we're gonna use this. This is gonna be my custom form. All right, so how you how do you do that? Yes. Oh, I was just gonna ask, and you might be getting to this. Is on the wiki is there a downloadable like default form that you can edit so yeah. that there's some sort of base? Right here. You can download it, and I basically just once it's in Word, I just added that logo up here. But there's also, and I clicked on here under, it was accounts receivable, more information. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I have a link here, so. Oh, okay, it's under billings. So once you go, that makes sense. To accounts receivable, go to billings, and then it's at the bottom. Sorry for the scrolling. AR template. And then if you need more information about customizing, that's where you can come here and it'll, this is where you might have came here for the disbursement form if you're customizing those. So then we created that form. And then to get it into the instance, we would go to the report manager, create a form. Um, call it whatever you like. And then the entity type would be billing. And then you would select your form and upload it. So I actually have that. So again, I named it custom billing form, entity type, billing, and then the document, save. So now, oh, and there's a little bit more setup just to ensure this works. Once you do this, it's advised to go to the billing and print it because if it prints okay, then it will email okay. But if it doesn't print, okay. Oh, and then you see that and you can choose here. Um, so that prints okay, it will email okay. But sometimes if it doesn't print okay, it won't give you a message about how it did not email. It looks like it emailed, but it didn't. So once you upload it, just test it. And then, You'll have to make sure your module for email notification is on. And mine is installed. The email configuration should be configured accurately. And most likely it is. The AR customer must have a email. So Pampered Chef has chef at gmail.com. And when you're troubleshooting for a district, you'll want to have the application configuration enabled for external no notifications. And then you also have the new accounts receivable, billing, email setup. This is where you can set up your uh, custom default form as well as your custom message within your email. So this is kind of nice. So it's gonna come from Mickey Mouse and Carbon Copy Me. And then my message that I, you can put in for the body of the email, you can put whatever you'd like the, for the user, but I put thank you for your services 
you have any questions, email or call. Thank you, AR department. And then you would choose your custom form. And notice all the tool tips, which are very helpful. So now, if we go to the billing grid, we should be all set up. I am going to email the um, Pamper Chef billing. You notice how it came up with what we just populated from Mickey Mouse, carbon copy me, my message I typed in. And here you can edit your two feature. However, if you pick more than one billing, notice you have no ability to update the two because you, you could be sending it to different customers, that's why. So with one, you are able to modify this to whatever you want. And then when it gets emailed, you will have, let's email that. A pop-up I'm just going to do it to myself telling you that one email is sent and if any failed and just so you know what it looks like um, so here's my oops sample email with my message and my attachment. And the attachment is gonna look like just what we set up with the logo, but the normal default form just with the logo. If you guys need any help with those forms, customizing forms, just submit a ticket. Uh, Let's see. Oh, so then now when you go to that customer or that billing, you can see it's kind of light, but this email sent is checked that it was actually sent. If that doesn't populate right away, it will once like the page refreshes. So if, it, if you don't see it right away, just give it a moment. And I believe that is all I have. If anybody has any questions, um, we do have some upcoming exciting Fridays with Fiscal, including the new inventory program in two weeks, as well as the mass change for USAS and payroll and miscellaneous adjustments in August. And another release highlights in September, gosh, that seems so far away, yet it's right around the corner. And then the dates for the OEDSA conference I put down here, the registration is not open yet, but if you don't know the dates, they are having an in-person conference. And those are the dates for this year. Any questions? Oh, I see I have a chat. Sorry, I'm not often good about change or watching that. Oh, okay, so Andrew, thank you, Andrew, for that update. And I guess I will stop this recording and if you guys have any questions, please submit a ticket and have a great weekend. And we'll see you next time on hopefully July 30th with the inventory. Thank you.